All right, let's go ahead and get started. I know it's super early and people will probably trickle in, but you know, we really only have 20, 30 minutes anyway, so we can start. Um, this is a weird talk for this conference, just so you know. I really didn't even quite expect it to be accepted uh, because it's much, much lower down the stack than most of the things we talk about in infrastructure, but it has a huge impact on the things that we work with in open infrastructure every day. So it's in the realm of this is really good to know. Uh, it may be a while before it affects your day-to-day -day work, but it's really good to know. So. Um, I've been working in the industry since the 90s on large-scale server deployments. We didn't call it cloud and containers back then, but it was a lot of the same technology. Um, a few years ago, I took a break from working at Hewlett Packard Enterprise in their cloud BU and started a PhD at the University of Cambridge. So um, this is kind of a combination of large-scale server deployments and security and all the way down to the microarchitecture level. So, it's, a, it's a, a weird span. So there's really three things I want to talk about, and one is looking at these particular vulnerabilities, um, how they started, how they affect us in cloud and containers. Um, talk a little bit about the PhD research I did, because that was some practical solutions, and then also want to point out some RISC-V work that you might be interested in. Uh, so uh, what I'm talking about, what, my, what I was studying, uh, well, originally what I was studying was virtualization security. That was my PhD topic. Uh, I started the PhD in January of 2018 when the Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities were first revealed. They'd been known about privately for about a year before that, but that's when they were first published. Um, and I pretty quickly realized that the kinds of virtualization security I was trying to work on were completely undermined by these vulnerabilities. Um, in some very weird, scary, action at a distance ways that you wouldn't expect. Um, so there have, in the past four years, a quite a number of different variants have been reported, but they all boil down to two simple classes of vulnerabilities, and once you understand those, you pretty much understand the whole set. Um, so the first class is the Spectre class, uh, and what these set of vulnerabilities do is they mistrain predictors in the microarchitecture, so down even below assembly language, like down, down, very, very bottom level of the machine. Um, and they can either leak privileged data or manipulate control flow, or actually manipulate control flow in order to leak privileged data. Uh, that's the scary things about them. Um, the meltdown class, um, is somewhat similar, but they actually take advantage of the fact that the way the microarchitecture works at a very low level, uh, you can have exceptions that you know it's an exception, like you know they shouldn't have access to that memory in that page table, but you don't actually make that exception visible until a point in time when you're certain that it should happen. Um, again, it's about these weird predictors and doing things that may or may not be real. Um, so Meltdown actually turns out to be pretty easy to mitigate, so I'm mostly gonna talk about Spectre. The, the trick for Meltdown is you actually have to do those permission checks for what memory you should be able to access right away, and don't just go ahead and look. What, what happens is they load the memory value, it's like a kernel memory, you shouldn't have access to it, but the way it works underneath, it just, it just goes ahead and loads the value, and it says, okay, you can't see this, so don't worry about it, it's not really here, and I'll eventually erase it when it's time to tell you that it's not real, but it turns out you can actually kind of poke holes at it behind the scenes. So those are the two classes we're looking at. That probably makes very little sense right now, so let me um, dive down a little bit deeper. Um, the way that most of us software developers think about like the machine at the very lowest level is we just sort of see it as, okay, we write our code, it translates it down to machine code, and then it just goes through, chunk, 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 chunk. It fetches an instruction, it executes it, it gives us a result. That's, uh, it's, not a, it's not an inaccurate model. It is a very simple model. So here's a little bit more what's really going on. Uh, so we have these things called predictors at a very, very low level of the hardware. Um, and when you, for example, you have an if statement that says, like, if password is valid, do this stuff. Um, so what happens is, the first time you do it, it does just go through, fetches, execute, gives you a result, which is to say, 
does that, it gets that branch instruction, checks the condition. If the condition is true, it does the other stuff. If it's not, it doesn't do the other stuff. But what happens is it then trains this predictor to say, okay, when I hit this condition, when I hit this branch condition, um, it tends to be true. It's often true. So to speed things up, just go ahead and execute it as if it's true. Just, just go ahead and do it. And you know, you'll enter this what's called like transient execution state. So it's you'll enter this state that's like, well, it's possibly, possibly true, possibly not true, but we're gonna go ahead and execute the code anyway, and you have all the side effects of executing the code. And then at the end, when it finally manages to evaluate the condition, uh, then it says, oh, well, okay, that did turn out to be true, so yay, go, keep running ahead. Or, no, that didn't turn out to be true, so erase, well, in theory, erase all that stuff that you did. Um, it's not always very good at erasing, and it turns out that you can actually um, poke holes in it even while it's in that transient state. So here's the worst part. It's actually more complicated than that. And that is, you don't just have a single instruction stream using this predictor. You have a whole bunch of instruction streams. And when you're working in like a context where you're running like a massive number of cores and you're actually oversubscribing your vCPUs on your CPUs and like you actually have a large number of instruction streams running through the same cores, right? So using the same predictors. So all of those are training the same predictors using virtual addresses for that branch instruction. Uh, so, and here's where it gets bad. If you have a malicious instruction stream, it can start feeding bad predictions into that predictor and then this, this victim instruction stream is going to start doing the things that that predictor tells it, just executing those instructions, that, like executing that if password is valid, you know, do this thing. It's just going to start like assuming if the, if the attacker trains it to believe the password is valid, it's just going to start doing that. And then it starts doing all these extra things that cause side effects that, um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit mind-blowing when you first kind of settle into this concept that the machine is actually doing a lot of work that it shouldn't be doing. And this, is, this has performance benefits. It has huge performance benefits. So this is too much information in terms of what it's really doing, uh, getting slightly more realistic. You don't need to see all of that. This is what really matters for this particular set of vulnerabilities is understanding this. Um, so, when you have a branch instruction, for example, that goes through a series of stage, stages, it's fetched from memory, a reorder buffer kind of holds it for a while, it goes into these reservation stations that queue it up for executing. And then that, that big red zone here is that red zone where you might be in this executing, but you might be executing speculatively. You might be executing in this transient state where you might just throw it away afterwards if you're good enough to actually clean it up, you might not. But for now, it's kind of a, I don't know, I, you can almost call it a superposition of they are not there. It's like, it's not really reality yet. It, it hasn't really gelled into reality yet. But that zone right there, that is the zone of risk for these particular vulnerabilities. And that is the only zone of risk for these particular vulnerabilities. It's actually very small. So the good news is um, there are actually some really simple techniques to mitigate these vulnerabilities. The bad news is they all have huge performance costs because that, that technique of predicting and just going ahead and executing things that you're not quite sure is, you're, you're going to need yet, um, that's actually a really good way to increase instruction level parallelism. That is, it's a really good way to run a whole lot of code through fast. Um, but it's that sharing of the predictors. You know, it's like, so as the predictions get better, which they train across a large set of code, then the code is faster, so the machine is faster. So sharing those predictions is good for performance. Sharing those predictions is bad for security. So it's, it's, this, it's that hard old age security performance trade-off, but in a really, really brass tracks way. Um, so one of the techni techniques is isolation which is to say, you know, don't share those predictions everywhere, just, you know, each VM has its own set of predictions and it can't share them. Or the kernel has its own predictions and it can't share them. Um, that's one really good way to isolate. It does have big performance penalties because you're not sharing them anymore. Um, 
Another is to flush, so you can just erase predictions at points where you think you might have risk. Um, that's not a very good solution, and it's a very expensive solution, but it is one of the techniques that active hard hardware is actually shipping today. Um, and another technique is to disable speculation uh, for certain contexts. Um, like to say, okay, I, my VM is a confidential VM and I just don't want speculation on it all. Don't, don't do the predictions at all. Um, so that's another set of techniques. The, very briefly, it is actually a fairly small number of predictors that we have in this system. They have a huge impact though. So uh, the, the first one is, handles direct and indirect branches. Um, there's a second one that kind of gives a little more information to direct and indirect branches. There's another one that handles conditional branches, another one that handles returns. So it like predicts where your return address is going to be um, to kind of speed things up. Uh, and another is the memory disambiguator, which basically says it, it predicts whether you've had extra stores to an address since the last load. So it kind of like predicts what the value will be or whether it's safe to use the same value. And it can be wrong. So then if it predicted wrong, it will like go back and, and reload it. So there's way too many variants to go into in detail. I just want to give you some sample ideas. So this is one, uh, this, the, this is one called Spectre BTB. So it mistrains direct or indirect branch predictions. Um, which means it basically convinces your machine that the address that it's supposed to jump to for a branch is different than the actual address. So it mistrains that branch, and then it starts telling it, no, jump to this other address, completely different address, which means it can tell your machine to execute completely random code that it shouldn't be executing at all. And what's worse is it can do this across security domains. So for example, uh, an unprivileged guest in your VM, in, in user space, in the VM, can mistrain your branches, and then when it makes a system call down to the kernel, if it's using the same branch, which you have to be a little bit smart about mistraining to actually get the right one, but then it can then make the kernel jump to execute some code that the kernel never should have been executing, but now it has kernel privileges because it convinced the kernel to jump to that code and start executing it. It's like, machines should just not do this. They just, just shouldn't. Um, so some variants on that one is SGX Spectre, which uh, exposes um, trusted execution environment or enclave, secure enclave secret data, things like provisioning keys and seal keys and attestation keys. So it's like the keys to the kingdom that make your confidential computing safe it's then leaking them all over the system and completely undermining those protections. Um, there's another variant that bypasses certain mitigations around flushing or partitioning. Uh, there's another variant we found that, like Intel launched this like supposed fix for the first vulnerability, Spectre BTB, but then later it was discovered that actually that isolation on the, on the branch target buffer, because there's this extra source of data the, the branch history buffer that's feeding into it, you can mistrain just this other source of data which still wasn't protected, and that then manages to mistrain the main predictor, and then you end up with the same vulnerability. So like, Intel has, protect, uh, has protections shipping in production that actually don't do anything, unfortunately. Uh, so, and, and that particular, that last one is actually not being released until, I mean, it's public, but it's, it's scheduled for a conference in August. So stuff is still actively happening on this. Even four years later, we're still finding new stuff. So I, I, I said in the last slide that it can be in place or out of place, and this is where that scary action at a distance stuff starts happening. Um, so you can mistrain a branch in the, within the same process. You can mistrain a branch from a different process, and you can mistrain a branch from the same address space or actually from a congruent virtual address in a different address space. Because the predictors are going by virtual addresses, you can actually trick it into, you, you can do the training in this one address space and trick it into doing a completely different branch instruction in a completely different address space 
the wrong way because you mistrained the predictors and they're shared. So I kind of started with this, with two questions when I started my PhD work. And one was, how the heck did we get here? Like, we've been doing this speculative execution stuff since the 70s. How did we get to a point where our hardware is so completely undermining our software security and nobody noticed it? Like, that doesn't make any sense. And then the next piece is, is there any way I'll ever trust multi-tenant computing again, like cloud and containers, because I now know this? Um, it's kind of like being the cook, you know what went into the food, and sometimes you don't want to know what went into the food. Um, so my, my work was design space exploration, uh, mainly around those disable mitigation techniques. They aren't the only techniques, they're just one tool in the toolbox. Uh, and I prototyped three different variations of a RISC-V core, a speculative RISC-V core that is known to be vulnerable, um, to kind of explore the possibilities here. And then I uh, ran the simulations on Amazon FPGAs, which is actually a pretty cool use of FPGAs. You can compile RISC-V cores and full SOCs, compile, synthesize, and then run them on the cloud. And it's, so it's like, it's like the way we would think of doing CI for cloud or containers, but you're actually doing it for the hardware designs. Um, it's pretty cool. There, there's a lot of room there that we're, not, that we're not really making use of yet. And there's also some tools, uh, Fire Marshal, builds your full like Linux images with your, with your workloads for the Amazon FPGAs, and FireSim does some orchestration around spitting out like thousands of FPGAs at a time running SOC, running RISC-V cores. So there's some pretty cool tools out there. So my work was specifically focused on a very familiar space to you, and that is cloud and containers, this multi-tenant infrastructure where you have um, a host OS on a machine and a series of guest OSs, VMs or containers, it doesn't matter which. For this particular domain, it doesn't matter which. The security problems are the same. Um, so in this context, you know, there are many channels of information flow that we want to allow, right? We want to allow guests to talk to each other. We want to allow the, talk, the host to talk to the guests. We want to allow connections out to the internet like, and back in. Like, these are all good, but for every channel of information we want to allow, there are channels we don't want to allow. And that's where secure isolation comes in. Is it's not so much about blocking off everything. It's about choosing what channels are allowed and what channels are not allowed. So how did we get here uh, to this point where there's this fundamental flaw in the hardware that we didn't know about and are, re are really still not quite sure how to fix? Um, so I spent a lot of time looking through computer history, uh, and that's kind of, there's a big section in my dissertation on that. But the really quick answer is, in the early days, we used to co-design hardware and software. So like this is the, that, that's an example of a machine that was like co-designed for security. Uh, they did, the, the, the team who worked on it, they built the hardware, they built the operating system, they built the applications, they built everything. Um, so there were people who had a good understanding of the full stack, like the full, full stack, not just front end, back end, but all the way down to the lowest level of the hardware. It turns out that's not a very efficient way to design things, and over time, as systems got more complex, we went for more modular and recombinable sort of stratification, architectural stratification and standardization. So we have reusable CPU memory storage that we like combine into building machines. We have reusable kernels and system utilities and operating systems and applications that we combine to build our host and our guest uh, workloads. Um, so this is a wonderful thing for ease of maintenance and development um, because you can focus on your one area of the stack and that's good and you don't have to redesign everything from scratch every time. The hard side of that is, is over the decades, that means fewer and fewer people actually understand the full, full stack. And that has problems both ways. So, I mean, there's, there's the one side of like the software developers don't really necessarily understand how the hardware works. Like, they, like like, you don't really need to think about speculation in your day-to-day -day work on cloud computing. It's not a thing that comes to mind. There's no reason it should, it's just a waste of brain space. Um, but on the other hand, the microarchitecture designers do not understand the software that is running on their machines, and they don't know what they're designing. 
Uh, and this comes up over and over and over again where I'm talking to them and they're like, we do this, we do this. And it's like, that's not how ac people actually use servers, no. Um, so this is how we got here. This is how we got here, is that we're not talking to each other. We're not communicating across the full level of the stack. And nobody realized, nobody at the low level realized what the high level was doing. Nobody at the high level realized what the low level was doing. And here we are. So there was an assumption that the microarchitecture designers made that it's fine to create a sort of transient state. It's in this, in this zone, in this zone of speculation, it's fine to create state. It's fine to like um, uh, store passwords or store data that's like kernel, kernel memory that you shouldn't have access to and things like that. It's fine to store it as long as it's cleaned up and it's never visible from the architect at the architectural level. So it's never, never visible at the high level, in theory. Um, it turns out that once it's there, you can find sideways back doors to get at it. So um, that was not a good assumption that they were working on, that it was safe to just randomly create state and then hope it'll be cleaned up eventually. There was a guy in 2005 who published a paper that started to kind of, he, he hinted in on some of the risks of these sets of features being combined, um, but even he didn't really quite see the potential. And it wasn't until uh, 2017, 2018 that people really started to realize what this meant. So the question of will I ever trust multi-tenant computing again? There are a few angles on trust. You've actually probably heard quite a number of them this week uh, in various different talks. So what I, where I started was just, do I trust that isolation between VMs? Uh, do I trust that anymore? Because it's been clearly demonstrated that it can be violated. Um, but there are other aspects. There's, you'll see trusted computing floating around, and that's, that tends to talk about things like attestation and cryptographically signed software. Um, Confidential computing tends to talk about things like encrypted memory or trusted execution environments. They're all related, they're related concepts, but technically they're slightly different. The hard fact is they're all undermined by speculation. Um, so it's like, this really does affect our day-to-day -day lives. So here's this, how do I trust it now? Speculation has performance benefits. Restricting it has security benefits. So if you share less of those predictions, you improve security. If you share nothing, then you get even better security. So my look at it was, well, is there some way we can combine speculation and no speculation and actually give system software developers the ability to choose, like, is this a confidential computing environment where I absolutely desperately need this protection, or is this like game high scores that like, it really doesn't matter if they leak, it's not a big deal. And if we could combine them, and if we could give system software developers the power to choose, how would that work? So very quickly, uh, talk to me if you want more details. Um, I made one prototype that just took a speculative core and a non-speculative core and stuck them together, heterogeneous computing. And if you want secure workloads, you run them on the non-speculative core. Uh, so the non-speculative core has the advantage that it can't mistrain other workloads, so if you have code you're not really sure you trust, you can run it there and it can't mistrain anything on the system. And it can't be, code on the, on the non-speculative core can't be mistrained, so it's the protect confidential side, like nothing outside, your host OS, no, no other VMs, nothing can mistrain that particular body of code. Um, I learned the performance is not very interesting. If you run it on the non-speculative core, it runs as well as a single non-speculative core. If you run it on the speculative core, it runs as well as the single speculative core. That's not a big deal. But it's not viable for cloud computing because doing it as heterogeneous cores means you have to decide in advance how many speculative, how many non-speculative cores. That is a really horrible resource, alloc resource allocation problem to decide in advance for your servers. So, not viable for that. It, it can be viable for like tablets or laptops or something like that. Uh, I made one variant. Uh, the names are all physics jokes. The tachyon is, uh, violates the, the laws of causality, so it's impossible. Um, so I made one that's like entirely non-speculative, uh, which does protect against all known variants and all unknown future variants of speculative execution vulnerabilities. Um, I expected the performance to be absolutely 
terrible. Uh, it turned out the performance was not all that bad. It was a 30 to 60% performance penalty, which sounds horrible until you realize that for current mitigations, the performance penalty for just one that mitigates just one variant can, is 30% in many cases, and it can be as bad for flushing techniques as a 200% performance penalty. So 30 to 60% for complete protection is, I mean, it's not great, it's not, it's actually not all that bad compared to the other mitigations out there. Um, and I also learned that you can perf improve performance by increasing parallelism in other ways. There are, there are these low-level, I would kind of call them data structures in the hardware that manage the flow of instructions. And if you increase parallelism in those without using speculation, you can actually increase performance and still not have the, the risk of speculation. And the last one, which is probably the most interesting, is combining the two on a single core so that you can, for, for example, say, okay, this, this VM, this is a confidential VM, this VM, I don't want that to do any speculation at all. Uh, but the rest of the system I really don't care about. Or you could say, the kernel, I never want the kernel to speculate because I really must protect that, but you can speculate in other places. So it, it gives you a little bit of more power over where you speculate and where you don't. Uh, I prototyped it as an ISA extension, so it actually added non-speculative instructions, but that's not the way I would do it in production. I would do it, I, in production, I would associate it with like a VM or a process or, you know, like a logical existing security domain. Um, so I learned that performance is determined by how much you use non-speculative regions. So, you know, if you, if you use very little non-speculative code, the performance can be as good as or almost as good as a straight up speculative core. Um, if you use a lot of non-speculative code, then the performance uh, can be as bad as or almost as bad as a completely non-speculative core. But it kind of gives, gives you more control. So this is my food for thought for you. If the hardware of the future gave you the ability to say, I want my VM, like in your cloud panel where you're like launching your VM or on your command line, if, you, what gave it, if it gave you the ability to say, I want this VM to be more secure, would you use that such a feature? Um, I think in some ways containers, they're more familiar with this concept because you do kind of like decide what layers of security protection you want to wrap around your containers. That's just sort of like people are used to that. I think in VMs, people are less used to that. They're used to configuring, you know, how many VCU, vCPUs, how much RAM, how much storage, but they're not used to thinking about configuring how much security. Um, and if you think it might be interesting, this is how you get involved. So we have a group in RISC-V that's called the Microarchitecture Side Channel Security Group. We're actually designing these protection features for future hardware. Um, there's also some other groups that if you're interested in just that whole, you know, we should have more people who are involved in the full stack and talking across the full stack. There's some other groups in RISC-V you might be interested in. There's the trusted computing SIG, and they're implementing trusted execution environments. There's a reliability, availability, serviceability SIG. Uh, there's a quality of service SIG. So they're, they're really, they're designing the features that will make RISC-V hardware work for the cloud. Um, also, as I'm sure you've heard a dozen times from various different talks all week long, uh, we are hiring, and I will say virtualization and Rust are uh, some, interesting idea, some interesting hiring needs right now. So that is it. Thank you. We might have time for one or two questions, but, or catch me afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, so that's one of the hard truths of this, is this can both leak your memory after you dec decrypted it, it can also leak your encryption keys, which then allows other VMs on the system to access that. So it does undermine. I mean, it's, it's still a good idea to encrypt your memory for your confidential VMs, like that is for confidential computing, it's a good idea, but these particular vulnerabilities do undermine those kinds of features as well. Yeah. 
Really, yeah, Intel, AMD, ARM, everybody's vulnerable to it. There, there, are, there are mitigations in place now for some things. They can mitigate some things, they can't others. It's kind of a patchwork. And some of it is like features you have to turn on and not all cloud providers do because of the performance penalties. Um, and you, you kind of have to, whatever your cloud provider decided to turn on or not in the hardware is what you're stuck with. You don't have any choices. Uh, Yeah, sorry, someone came in halfway through your question, but I think the question is, if you have speculative and non-speculative code running on the same machine, how do you protect against speculative code attacking the protected non-speculative? The, the reason I call this technique ghosting, so you can think of it like, okay, someone sent you a text and you just didn't reply. Um, the disabling techniques, part of the way they work is they just don't create that microarchitectural state that the vulnerabilities leak. They never create it, and so it can't be leaked. And that's kind of their, that's their game. Uh, they never create those predictions, they don't use those predictions, so they can't be, they can't be influenced by them or manipulated by them. Um, so that's, that's why it works. It does mean that, that the speculative code is still more vulnerable, but I mean, not everything is so, so affected by leaking with speculation. You know, like game high, you know, game high scores. Like, nobody really cares if someone leaked your game high score. They really care if, you know, you took an action that was supposed to be password protected and you ignored the check for whether it was password protected and then you leaked some data that was never supposed to be accessed at all. Right, like those things they care about. But there's other things that you don't. So it's like, the, the, the idea is to give people the options to choose, which specifically the software developers themselves, the options to choose, because they're the ones who know, is this game high stores or is this hospital patient data? You know, is this, is this something that really needs to be protected from, from leaking or is this something that, it, it, this is not actually important. Thank you, everyone.